Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So there are maybe a few good things about living in Korea as a Korean American. Namely, you don't have to deal with racism. You can sort of just blend in as part of the mainstream population. But if you have something that upsets you about the system, they really don't like to listen to Korean Americans. They really just see us as kind of like stepping out of our place and being really like nitpicky about their, you know, homeland. But if you have a Korean ajuma, things get done. It's basically like the Korean Karens things will get fixed, but there is one critical area in the whole Korean government system, immigration, that is so sorely in need of repair that does not get covered by Korean ajumas. So the Korean Karens don't have their like rah, 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 like rage at the system. So this is one area where no matter how much Korean Americans could protest, they ignore us. They don't care about us. They just, you know, put us down. But if you get a white lady speaking public about it, we may have some progress. And today, we got our white lady. Yes, thank you, white lady. She's from the UK. She has a Scottish accent and she has a big bone to pick with the immigration office here in Korea. And I'm just here to amplify her message. Now, just like Korea's democracy progression, Customer service in Korea has gone through a rocky road. People on the whole say customer service in Korea is extremely good, and it is. We call it AS, after service, and usually things are convenient. It's trustworthy. It's fast. Like, usually it's like same-day service. But I do think it is because... There has been a lot of abusive customers, namely, like I said, the Korean Karens or the Korean Ajumas or Korean Ajashis, to the point where now if you call the Korean customer service line in Korean, they're basically saying, thank you for calling. Like, let's say it's like your cell phone company. Please do not verbally abuse our representatives. Please think of them as your own children and let's have like a harmonious society. I mean, to the point where you have to record that on your greeting, like instead of say, hello, we value you as a customer. It's like, hello, thank you for being a customer and please don't abuse our employees because we're recording this. In the places that haven't been exposed and called out, and it takes being exposed and called out, I think, in Korea. It takes muscle for progress. It takes, like, force against force. It's not like, let's have a conversation. Uh-uh. It's like, mm-mm. So, because the Korean ajumas don't have to go through immigration, I think this place has really fallen down. And, like, whenever I've had to go there, it's like a third world country. And no offense to third world countries, but, you know, Korea always said that like, it rose up through the ashes of being a third world country developing nation status. Well, that place stayed down there. And even, like, the facilities and buildings you go there, you're, you're like, where am I? You know, is this, a, is like, this is like a bomb shelter? Well, let's get back to that white lady. This nice white lady who on Twitter decided to drag our immigration service through the mud. And she is no ordinary white lady. No, 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 no. She is the sole bureau chief for BBC News. Yes, the TV news channel that goes out to the entire world. And not only is she a reporter there and the sole bureau chief, she has been to the Blue House. She has sat down one-on-one -on -one with President Moon Jae-in for an extensive, exclusive interview. 
Now, last video was about Nunchi. She kind of didn't have Nunchi because like if she was having problems like this over at the immigration, she should have just whipped out that YouTube video and said like, oh, look, you know, like I'm really busy. Like my next interview is going to be a follow up to this, you know, with the president. She would have she would have gotten whatever she wanted. And that is the problem with the system. Still, if you have like authoritarianism, things that are not fair, you got to pull out all this like. Like, well, I got this power, I got this reputation, I got this connection in order to get through this, like, sloth. And it shouldn't be that way. And I'm glad she didn't pull rank and try to, you know, do all of that kind of stuff because she really showed truly what the system does. Now, I would say she kind of, like, got off a little easy like her problem was probably like maybe like five percent ten percent of the problems that most people face or that what she was trying to get done was not even like the full menu it was probably just like a little a la carte thing but even that pissed her off and i believe she was going through the airport so even there the immigration process is a lot better than if you actually have to renew your long-term resident visa here in Seoul. Please do not go there. You will find hell on earth, literally. If you ever want to, like, find a reason to go back to church if you are religious, renew your visa. So this is what she said on Twitter. Dear Immigration Service in Korea, your re-entry visa application system is awful. Locked out of website, having to call for help, told to fax, yes, fax details to a number to reset my password. Asked if I could go to immigration office. No, no, he said. Last time I applied at the airport because of this mess and because I ran out of time to apply online, needs at least three days, the young lady there shouted at me for 10 minutes. If you're going to make us apply for this, the least you can do is make it simple. Now, in that, yes, the frustration, first of all, people are surprised that in order to reset a password, you actually have to fax and then it goes to a physical person and they're redoing it manually. Who has a fax machine these days? And so it's these little things that really then like destroy somebody's time and destroy somebody's day. And it's these things that you cannot anticipate because these are out of the boundaries of normal. If you told a Korean person to go through any of these things that the foreigners have to go through through immigration, you could not go into that immigration office without earbuds because there would be so much screaming and yelling going on. You could probably hear it in North Korea. And so she said that this young lady shouted at her, Miss BBC world correspondent who sat down with Moon Jae-in for an interview, yelled at her for 10 minutes. And you wonder why people in customer service have to ask, please don't yell at us. Well, maybe because you're picking fights with people. And so I have definitely seen aggressive, mean just bitter and jealous people in immigration. I think it might have something to do with maybe it's kind of like a, uh, maybe that job attracts those types of people because it is a way to try to use your power of position, your own little power to try to like abuse people who are not familiar with the system so you can get away with treating people badly and then always say like oh well they just don't understand or oh they don't understand the language and i and i and i say this because i don't even think it's limited to korea because mr song in lax immigration he was the worst horrible and this was like a korean american guy that was like totally abusing me and like i just gone off a flight from korea you're going in i'm just kind of like groggy and you know you're going through the paperwork and then you know they're doing like some interview but usually it's just so like oh business or pleasure what are you doing and then he's kind of like chatting and i was just like oh my gosh okay right sean you're back in america people are chatty here all right so we're gonna have to chat and he's like oh so what do you do for a living and at that time i was you know working for the broadcasting station i was like yeah you know like i work in tv news and he's like well how'd you get that job i was like Oh, um, I supplied, I auditioned. He's like, well, blah, blah, blah. and then he started trying to pick a fight with me. And then I was just like, oh, like, 
am I like a security risk or something because I've done like, you know, journalism? Because like in other countries, people get mad if you're a journalist. Uh, they look at you with more suspicion. But then I was like, wait a minute, this is the United States. It doesn't look like he's going there in that direction. This guy looks like actually he's, oh, like really upset about his life and he wants to pick a fight with me. And then so I was just trying to be nice to him. And then he's like, you know what? We're not friends. I was like, yeah, of course not. So why are we having this conversation? And then he sent my whole like luggage to go for the worst inspection to add more time to my thing. And then when I got there, I was just like, and then the guy who was inspecting was just like, oh, again? Like I could totally tell like, you know, this guy does that repeatedly, abuses his position and sends people he doesn't like for like some unnecessary inspection. And the other guy was just like, Oh God, that dude again. And so yeah, that was that guy was like a Korean American guy. I don't know what his problem was, why he was so upset, you know, about his life. Like I think a lot of people would probably like his cushy government job with probably cost of living adjustments guaranteed every year. And you know, he wasn't like a bad looking person either. So loser. Yeah, song in LAX calling you out. Anyhow, so I also had this experience with the password and I think I had to do the facts, but there was one time where I had to upload files from my computer and it just wasn't working. And you think like, this makes no sense because like every other com computer kind of system, like you just upload, you know, picture of your driver's license, picture of this, and it's fine. So I call and they said like, okay, well, you know, we can install a program on your computer and I can control your computer remotely and do it for you. And I was like, this sounds really shady, but like they, they get you down to this point where you're, you're just so desperate to get this done. And you're just like, okay, well, it's the government. Maybe I could trust them. He goes onto my computer. He puts up a big window thinking that he covered all of my screen but i saw him he did a whole drag like cup copy and paste of my desktop files like all the folders that were on my desktop and he he copied it into something like his own usb i was like shady but i couldn't say anything and then he's like, oh, pretend, you know, he's like helping me. He's like, okay, now it's all uploaded. And he said, base, and I said, like, what is the problem? Why did I have to go through this with you? And he said, like, well, first of all, the file can't be more than one megabyte for the photo. I was like, it never said that anywhere. He's like, yeah, I know. And, I, and then he's like, and also the file, you can't really have it in a folder that's too many layers deep. You have to just save it on your desktop. I was like, you never said that. And he's like, yeah, I know. And he's like, and also the file name can't be more than eight characters because then it kind of sometimes messes up the system. I was like, it never said that either. He's like, yeah, I know. And so this system is so ridiculous that nobody could get through it. And sometimes it gets better, sometimes it gets worse. Every time I have to renew, it's a whole different world, different ball game, different set of expectations, different set of paperwork. So I understand the frustration of this white lady who is now probably, can you please be our spokesperson? and try to get some reforms done. Now, this is how I think we can easily solve the reforms. In the local government offices, I was shocked at how wonderful the service is. And mainly, I think, because I've heard there was a reform, every document that you get at like the local government office, you know, if you need like proof of residency or you need to do something to like your driver's license or something, on the document has the name of the government employee that helped you. So that civil service officer has accountability on that document and everything can be traced to that transaction that they made. I think on the on the bulk of it, it was to try to prevent corruption because in definitely like the 70s and 80s, if you wanted anything done, when you handed your document over, you always had to put money in there apparently. Like it was a lot of that kind of bribery going on. Told you. And so I think there was, you know, that totally cuts that out. But what it does subliminally and then also just in accountability wise, all of the employees have a vested interest in doing a good job and 
I could tell like people there were at least, you know, I think the impression I got is that they liked their job. They were proud of their job. And I think you can really tell a lot about a company about how the lowest ranked employee treats you solution oriented. Now that is the huge difference. When you're in this kind of like you lived under dictatorship and then you go to government services, the last thing they want to do is solve the problem that you've come in to solve. The first priority that they have are essentially very much like abusing you or trying to please their master or just trying to get through the day. The worst experience I had was when I had to one time renew my visa and I've renewed it multiple times. And this particular year, I actually had to go and register my own birth. What? They said like, oh, well, the laws have changed. So, and what they were essentially trying to do is try to capture more men to go to the military. And so they were trying to target a very small group of what they probably call like golden spoon overprivileged uh, Koreans who intentionally go have their kids overseas and then bring them back and raise them like Koreans and then just say like, oh, but they're, you know, not Korean citizens. So they had, so my son doesn't have to go to the military. This is a very small section of very privileged kids, but they were targeting them. And then, then you were catching all of these like side effects. So people like me, I was like over 40 and... I had to walk into one of these district offices. So then the district, after going through the whole immigration debacle, like being like, oh, this is not as easy as it was before. They're like, yeah, you have to do all this, 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 and this. And then so I walk in, I was like, to the local office who have, hasn't heard about this new thing. They don't even know anything about this kind of stuff. I was like, I have to register my birth. And then they're like, Wait, uh, you mean you had a baby? Oh, congratulations. I was like, no, I have to register my own birth. And they're like, what? How old are, are you? I was like, like over 40. I have to do this for like renewing my visa. And they're like, well, were you born in Korea? I was like, no, this is crazy. But I've been told I have to come here. I have to register my own birth in order to renounce my citizenship. And they're like, wait, are you a Korean citizen? I'm like, no, I've never been a Korean citizenship. But the immigration office told me that I have to register my birth and then I have to go and go to a separate office with that birth certificate to then renounce my Korean citizenship that I never had in order to then move on to the next regular process of renewing my residency visa. Crazy. Now, if you were under 40, before you weren't required to go to the military, but under this new law, which was under the Moon Jae-in administration, we'll get to that a little bit in a little bit, there were some people who were like, maybe they were like 35 or like early 30s to 40 who had not anticipated this. They were also expats. They were like Korean Americans. They were working in uh, all sorts of fields, but, you know, contributing to Korea's economy, increasing the brain talent and productivity of Korea, but they had to leave Korea because otherwise they would have to go to the Korean military. They were never born in Korea. They never had Korean citizenship. And yet, because their parents were Korean, the government suddenly said that like, oh, your parents forgot to register you as a Korean citizen when you were born. But my parents had no intention of bringing me back to Korea to raise me up here as a child. I grew up in the United States. They were essentially forcing kind of like 
the situation where that they were trying to penalize, where they're trying to say like, oh, they should have registered you as a Korean citizen, even if you weren't living in Korea. So what? Like, then I could like take advantage. Then you would be accused of taking advantage of Korea. Like, you know, I'm not living in Korea, but what I was supposed to register as a Korean and then like be entitled to what a Korean citizen has, like they would have gotten mad at me for that. Had I come to Korea and said, when I first came to Korea and started working and said like, oh, I want to register my birth. People would have said, you're crazy. You have no right to do that. You were born in America. Why would you do that? But yet now I was forced to. These things don't make sense, but the way that but the reason why it happened was they were weaponizing this immigration system to target these rich kids, essentially. They were trying to target like these rich kids that they were not happy with, you know, under this Moon Jae-in government. It was like kind of more like revenge politics and then everybody else got wrapped up into it. How do I say that with so much certainty? Because I have some inside information. Before this long went into effect, I was at a dinner party and there was this professor and she was actually hired to do the white paper or like the research on the justification for changing and modifying these rules. And she was kind of just getting, you know, uh, like she was inter sort of interviewing us, getting our sense of it. And I thought she was just doing kind of like a mental exercise Exercise. Like, because I thought this was so ridiculous. And she said that some of the reasons was that, oh, well, you know, it's because people who have this particular visa have advanced English skills. So it's unfair to other Korean people because if you have English skills, you have a better shot in the job market. I was like, wait, 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 wait. The people who have this F4 visa who have English skills are not 100% of the population. It's maybe about like 20 or 30% of the population. What about the people from China? They don't have the English skills. And just because of that, you're saying that we should go to the military to balance out this so-called social inequity. What if this person doesn't have these so-called English skills. And why does that, why is that the only metric for advantages? There are so many other disadvantages that we have as Korean Americans, or even if you're from, you know, if you're Korean Chinese with this visa, there is so much discrimination in the job place. I cannot get the same job as a Korean person in Korea, regardless of whether, whether I can speak English or not. So, I was like, wow, that is the logic that's being used to justify this kind of policy that will affect so many people's lives. And it did. It did. It made people leave the country. And some people waited it out and actually came back, I guess. And other people, they just left for good. And so it was very xenophobic. It was done under a liberal administration. And so check out my other video about like, you know, who actually are like, I was surprised. Like I found uh, more, it's debatable. It's totally debatable. But just because somebody, let's just say, just because somebody says they're liberal in Korea does not mean they're not racist. So don't let that fool you. And so that was just a crazy experience immigration that place needs to be reformed bbc lady laura bicker i think we need to live up to your name we got to have a whole lot of bickering going on about immigration because that thing needs to be reformed especially since korea relies so much on the international markets in order to survive if we had any level of the russian level sanctions that are going on right now korea's economy would be over in a month like it would maybe you could get away with being this xenophobic if you had a self-sustaining economy and self-sustaining security mechanism. But we rely so much on the global markets 
and global security alliances that if you are pissing people off like this in immigration, that is the wrong message to send and puts Korea in such a perilous situation and does not help the people who are then, after they leave Korea or they talk about what happened in Korea, does not help with international relations and PR for the country, let me tell you that. And when they go through immigration, yeah, they're just staying quiet about it because they just need to get through. They're threatened with like not being able to get their visa, so that's why they're staying quiet. But in their minds, let me tell you, they're thinking, I guess this is the level of, of the country, huh? So, Korea, new administration, please. In the immigration office, make each immigration officer put their name on the document. Start there. Very simple. And it's free. Doesn't cost a thing. You don't have to buy any computer program. And I think instantly you will start to see results. They will start to fix their own problems and you won't have to lift a finger. What do you guys think? What are your horror stories with immigration if you had to deal with it? And how is immigration in your country? Is it a place where there's just like a lot of abusers who just want to go in there and just like work and try to like take advantage of people at their most vulnerable? I think we need to have like an international like protest. All right, guys. Talk to you later. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Bye-bye. Tune in next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Love you.